space for it just because of the slides and you know Life has been so busy I believe it. <laughs> in so many different areas of life. Do you feel um, like all settled into your new place though? Yes, but yeah, go ahead. I have to deal with bugs. So yeah. like <laughs> my whole <laughs> apartment <laughs> here, it looks like, like I just moved in yesterday <laughs> because I had to like prep it for an exterminator. Oh my god. So, well, at least um, you're out of the way now. now you have roommates so. that are a little, <laughs> a little yeah, colors. but they're going today. Like my apartment is being like fully treated, like nice. spiders, like everything's getting like Done. yeah. <laughs> nice. I was like, every type of spray that you have, I want just it in like, my house. Like, 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 yeah, but it's good. I definitely, like, I didn't tailgate last weekend, which it was, like, blasphemy for me. I was, me. like, looking for him, like, that. Um, <laughs> but I was just so, like, with all these bugs in my apartment and everything, I was just, like, I have to focus on this. Yeah. yeah. And then I was also just, like, so defeated from it all. Like, I was just, it's not really gateway, so, surprisingly. There's like a oh, lot really? of bugs there. Probably because there were so many people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's gross. At least you got your sandal though, because I could never like call an exterminator. Yeah, there. my building <laughs> manager like really blew me away with how fast. Like the next day they had an exterminator there. Oh, wow. oh are we all ready? I'm ready. Okay, yeah, well ready. we're ready to. Um, so it looks like we have a small group today, but um, we are recording for the people at home who can't make it or at work. Um, but this is Laurel Fell. I'll let her introduce herself more in depth, but you all got to see a little bit of her bio. She is a faculty member from uh, Annenberg. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll let Laurel take it away. Thank you so much, Solomon. Thank you guys for being here. Hooray! We are the few, we are the crowd. <laughs> And to everyone in Internetville, thanks for tuning in. Um, so, as some mentioned, my name is Dr. Laurel Feld, and I work here at USC Annenberg. I also got my PhD here at Annenberg, so I'm a really proud Trojan. Um, what else can I tell you? I am passionate about public speaking, and I hope that you can be too. The title of my talk, or of this experience that I hope we're going to co-create together, is Playful Public Speaking. So I'd like for you all to have fun. I intend to have fun. And I believe that fun enables learning. So if we're not having a good time, then probably uh, what is happening Hello. is not going to make such an impression. And since you all are studying education, I feel like I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, right? You know how vital it is for students to be engaged in order for them to learn. So if you're not really paying attention, you're not enjoying it, then what you have to say won't make an impression. And uh, not only will it uh, fail to show up in your short-term memory, but it also won't show up in your long-term memory. So all of this is to say, let's have a good time. I'd like for us to start by doing a little community exercise. Uh, because we had some transition time getting into the room and we're going to have to leave some at the other end, my original idea, which was for you to pair up with a partner and to tell a story about public speaking and to go in a couple of rounds, I'm going to have to jettison, <laughs> which <laughs> is a big part of teaching, as you know, and it's a big part of public speaking that you often have to react on your feet to things that are occurring that you hadn't anticipated. That's some of the fun of this, that this can be an opportunity for you to be creative and spontaneous, to embrace opportunity to say yes. So once Solomon told me about some of our constraints in terms of the room, I decided to get rid of that idea, but I kept it on my slide so that I could share this humorous anecdote with you. <laughs> and also to offer it to you as an idea for an activity because Solomon said that many of you will have to give workshops or will host trainings or other kinds of engagements of that nature. So you might want to start out with the community piece, getting people to engage with other folks in the room, not just with one neighbor, but with multiple, can be useful to um, up the energy and to create multiple allies. And to, to tell a story is a really effective device 
for helping people to get a sense of who you are and to get a sense of your sort of outlook by hearing about the way that you see things, by getting a sense of your sort of vernacular, like the words that you choose to use, whether you have an accent or not, and stories are really effective vehicles for education. Again, you probably already know this, that humans are hardwired for stories, we're storytelling animals. So whenever anybody starts to tell a story, we perk up, like interesting story time, we tune in, and we tend to retain it in our long-term memory. Okay but we're not gonna do that, I'm such a tease. Instead, what I'd like for you to do is to introduce yourself to your neighbors. So the people who are next to you, the people who are behind you, maybe you already know one another, um, but now you'll really get a sense of one another and you will be one another's uh, sort of support network and learning partners for the remainder of today. So take a few minutes, introduce yourself to everyone in your orbit. I'm so glad that you made it here, Charlie. That's great. Come on. I'm scared. Thank you. I didn't know. I thought I was like, maybe you can do it. Okay. So I'm going to invite you to wrap up your introductions, find your seats once again. Thank you so much. Because we're a small but proud group, we were actually able to say hello to everyone, and I jumped in too. So I was able to act a little bit like a model. And again, because this is an informal space, I have that privilege. You might not always have that privilege, but when you do, you might as well exercise it. Build some allies, you yourself as the speaker, and show everyone the kind of energy and behavior that you hope that they will enact. So again, this is teaching practices um, that are relevant as a public speaker as well. Now I hope that you're feeling a little bit more connected to the people in the classroom, more connected to me, which is useful as well because I want you to take a risk and follow me on a journey. So that's the utility of doing some community building activities at the beginning. It also sends the signal that you matter that this presentation wouldn't be the same if I was sitting alone in my office in my house with my uh, camcorder set up in front of my face. That you are impacting what happens today, how I behave, and the course of events that unfold. Giving your audience the sense that they matter is really important because it will change the manner in which they listen which then will give you lots of validation for continuing. If people seem checked out, then you might start to get up into your own head thinking that what you have to say is invaluable or that you're failing, and that might impact your performance in a negative way, and it becomes a sort of vicious circle. So you show them that they matter, they'll show you that you matter, and we can all be on this together. The next thing that I think is really important to include in a talk is an overview or sort of roadmap. So it helps people to buy in to the uh, talk that you're about to deliver. It shows them what you have to share and hopefully convinces them that sticking around and that tuning in is worthwhile. Additionally, if and when their attention flickers, which it's bound to do and has nothing to do with you and everything to do with the people in your audience being human, they'll be able to quickly orient and join back in because they'll know where you are in your talk. So here's what we're going to do today. And some people want to come in. Come on. Oh, the door is closed. Oh, 
Okay, so here's our overview, gang, and this was also in the flyer that Solomon distributed, which is pretty good PR. So the people who showed up know what is coming. It helps to ensure that the right people are in the audience and that I can meet your expectations. So what we're going to do is to talk about strategies to manage anxiety, how to honor authenticity, how to incorporate humor, how to improvise, how to collaborate with the audience, build something together, and that is all for today. Uh, you notice that I had this text up here on click, so uh, I used a tool in PowerPoint called Animations, and you can make each thing up here. Perhaps you already know that about PowerPoint. The reason why I like to use it is so that I keep the audience with me and they don't tune out and start reading when I want them to listen and then don't listen because they've already read it at the point when I'm going through that text. So I like for us to all be in on it together. But in general, texting my jam. I want your slides to be visual. That way I'm not competing with other words and, and you know being my own worst enemy. I also think it's more interesting to look at. I am not the savviest when it comes to images, so you're in for a pixelated treat today. <laughs> All right. So now let's talk about how to manage anxiety. So first I'd like to talk about generalized anxiety, about just the general sense of feeling stressed. So hopefully this image gives you a sense of calm. I'd like to offer a mnemonic to you that can be useful when you're experiencing public speaking related anxiety or any kind of anxiety in order to better cope. That mnemonic is the word mess, M-E-S-S. -S. And I actually got this mnemonic from a student's presentation in my public speaking classroom. So good ideas can come from anywhere. M stands for movement. So in order to manage anxiety, think about movement. Whether that's really intense aerobic movement, like going for a run or taking a Zumba class in order to work out some of those jitters um, and get yourself back to a calm place. Whether the movement uh, that would be more useful to you would be a little bit more measured and sort of contemplative. So maybe that's stretching or a yoga practice or going for a walk. So somehow using movement as a method for attaining calm, whether that's cathartic, like my first example, or whether that's more sort of flowy and bringing yourself down to a really measured place, as in my second example. The E stands for energy. So think about ways in which you can measure your energy. Your energy uh, can be managed through your sleep practice, so do you need some extra sleep? Or when you get tons of sleep, does that actually make you more drowsy? Do you need a little bit of like a power nap? What does that mean for you? How can you manage your energy by being mindful about sleep? Also think about the fuel that you put in your body. So how can you manage your diet? Do you need to avoid sugar on a certain day? Do you need to totally tank up on caffeine? Do you need to like create a sort of base in your stomach full of protein so that you're not going to wither in the middle of the day because you're super tired and you have no energy? Do you need to like carb load? How does your body work? How can you set yourself up for success? At this point, I'd like to invite you to turn to a partner or a neighbor and talk about which practices in terms of movement and in terms of energy you think would be helpful for managing anxiety. Take about a minute, and I'll check back in with you. I I like that. I like that. I I like that. I I like I I I I yeah, great. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, I'd like to invite you all to sort of wrap things up. When you're ready, show me you're ready by looking at me with great eye contact. Amazing. My feet off. <laughs> okay, so now you guys have heard some ideas from your partner, and you've also thought yourself in a reflective sort of way about what you can do in order to manage anxiety for movement and for energy. Let's talk about the S and the X of the word mess. This is the first S stands for social connection. Uh, you could also think of it as support network. So the idea is people power. Who in your world can you turn to in order to process how you're feeling, in order to get some unconditional love and support, in order to be distracted, if that would be useful to you? How can you build in some connections with people who you know, love, and trust in order to help you to manage anxiety? So I'm a mama's girl, and I tend to call my mom during my commutes. And sometimes it's to talk through things that are on my mind. Sometimes it's just to check in. But um, I know that she is somebody who can, I can always turn to in order to discuss something that might be challenging me. So she's an important member of my support network, and that mechanism of getting her on the phone during the time of my commutes is available to me. So I encourage you to think about who you can turn to, when and how, in order to get the support that you need. Sometimes we have people that we love who we know will theoretically always be there for us. We're not necessarily sure how to get at them, or they don't really have time. So think about this. Okay, the next S is stress toolbox. So what do you put in your proverbial stress toolbox in order to help you manage challenging situations? So do you take a nice long bath or hot shower? Ablutions, which is like a million dollar word for uh, spending time with water basically, can be a really effective way to manage stress. Um, that heat and the immersion can be really cathartic. So perhaps you want to take um, a hot bath or a hot shower or go for a swim, sort of combine the movement with the stress toolbox there. Nice sensory experience for you. Sensory experiences in general can be really useful because they make us present and connect us back to our bodies so that we stop spinning up here get back to life down here. So think about aromatherapy or uh, treating yourself to some of your favorite foods or some massage, perhaps with a scented lotion. Again, we've got sort of like two birds, one stone happening there. Perhaps the things that are in your stress toolbox are some things that you just enjoy doing. So watching a favorite uh, television show on Netflix, for example, or going for a walk in nature. So you want to build in replenishing activities. The definition of stress is that we feel overly challenged, um, that some sort of experience is depleting us, that's asking for more than we have to give. So in order to balance stress, what you need to counter it with is a replenishing activity, something that fills us back up again, even makes our cup runneth over. So again, I'd like to invite you to turn to a partner and talk about who in your support network you can call on in order to help you manage stress, whether that's talking things through or just getting distracted and having a good time. And second, what's in your stress toolbox? Take a minute. <laughs> I would say my best friend. Like, I would talk to her about everything I say, and so I always go to her and I feel like that. Yeah. Or I would have, like, gone to her. It's pretty much like my go-to. Like, I'm only doing this because I have to do this. And I think you should definitely start trying to finish something like that. I have to talk to her. 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 I have to talk to her.
by turning back to me with your beautiful faces. Love it. Okay, so we've spent a lot of time talking about generalized anxiety and ways to manage that. The reason why I've really leaned into this area is because I think that this is a versatile, useful topic uh, that you can return to throughout your journey in and outside of public speaking contests. So I hope that that was useful. As a member of the USC community, I also happen to know that the OT school offers a free, amazing program called Lifestyle Redesign, in which they pair you with an occupational therapy student uh, to design tailored solutions that will help you sort of live your life better, whatever that looks like for you. Uh, I've done the program before and really enjoyed it. USC also has uh, student counseling services, and they have amazing professionals there. I've also availed myself of those services at a certain point over the years. So um, you might as well enjoy the services that USC offers. Yeah. What was the, the second to last one that you mentioned, um, where you work with students, or the student pair with students? It's called Lifestyle Redesign. And it's with the Occupational Therapy School. Lifestyle Redesign, it's awesome. I actually did it twice. My lifestyle needed to be redesigned. <laughs> I feel like I'm still working. <laughs> okay, so now let's talk about public speaking related anxiety, right? Which might be a major reason why you're all here in this room. First of all, fear of public speaking is one of the most normal things to fear on God's green earth. Um, there was some research that actually got um, distorted a little bit, but it made for a really funny joke on an episode of Seinfeld when he was saying that more people, and, and the research isn't exactly this, but he said that more people fear public speaking than fear death. So if you're at a funeral, you would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. <laughs> <laughs> Which I liked. So you're, you're in good company, and I hope that by the end of this session, you will fear death more. <laughs> Okay, so let's say that you're anxious about speaking in particular, then here are a few practices that, that I'd like to offer. One is visualization. Specifically, visualizing yourself going through the process of your speech, encountering some challenges, and managing to overcome those challenges through some effective strategies. So that the boogeyman of blanking won't freak you out You'll mentally rehearse yourself giving your speech, blanking, and then jumping to a different part of your talk, or pausing for a moment, collecting your thoughts, or cracking a joke, or ending early, or doing anything that will help you to manage that moment without like breaking down in tears, or throwing up, or running out of the room, right? You've got a couple of effective plans, or maybe just one, that you visualize. The point is that if and when you encounter that big, scary challenge, it doesn't surprise you, and you're not left without an escape route, if you will. You've already come up with your plan. So visualization can be really useful. I also recommend some positive self-talk. So, Treat yourself with self-compassion. Give yourself a lot of love. And remind yourself of your infinite capacity to learn and to grow. So perhaps you're familiar with the work of Carol Dweck with the idea of the growth mindset, right? Yep, not a fixed mindset. So you are malleable. You are versatile. You are flexible. You are capable of anything. You can master this if you care to. You are not stuck with limitations. You have the agency to change your life. So positive self-talk. I also recommend that you practice using your voice. A student this semester told me that she doesn't like the sound of her own voice, which made me kind of sad. 
It also made me think like maybe we need some positive self-talk up in there. Mm -hmm. Maybe she needs to talk to a helping professional, I'm not sure. But when it comes to getting comfortable with your voice, there are also some specific things that you can do. You can make a commitment to speaking a little bit more, whether it's to yourself, recording it on a voice memo, or just speaking aloud with no recording, just keeping yourself company as you're driving or walking or taking a shower. You can call your mom or someone in your support network a little bit more often and just acclimate yourself to speaking in our world where we walk around and like type a lot. Maybe you're not used to talking. You could also uh, reach out to a child in your life and read him or her books or tell him or her stories. You're gonna find a really loving and appreciative audience in a child. You can even treat a pet to that kind of behavior <laughs> or a plant. Plants thrive when you talk to them, actually. So there are all sorts of ways to win. I also recommend that you practice your talk, going through your talking points. So sometimes we're anxious that we're unprepared. Perhaps your anxiety is well placed if you truly are unprepared. So you might as well give yourself every opportunity to walk in feeling strong and confident. So if your confidence is shaky, I don't want it to be because you're unprepared. I want it to be because you need a little bit of pepping yourself up and then we'll pep you up. But do the work. Finally, you might want to think about creating some positive associations between public speaking and uh, something else in your life. So let's say that you love cupcakes. How about every time you work on your speech, you treat yourself to a cupcake or half of a cupcake? Um, so how can you turn working on public speaking into a treat and create some kind of conditioning practice? Or at least you hate the time that you spend with public speaking a little bit less. Rewards, I think, are useful. If you're feeling anxious during a talk, um, or, or immediately before, we'll talk about during in a second, immediately before, then you might want to do something called power posing. Who here has heard of power posing? <laughs> yeah, this went viral. This gal here is Amy Cuddy, the queen of the power pose. Now, if you want to hear some scandal, uh, there, <laughs> tune in, guys. I mean, this is like research scandal, so it's like, you know, salacious for a nerd, but maybe this is a safe space. Uh, I've actually read that some, uh, member of her research team claimed that the way in which they went about doing their research perhaps wasn't totally on the up and up. They might have been engaged in a practice called p-hacking, which artificially increases the significance of your results. I haven't really pursued this in great detail, so you can look it up. What I'm going to leave you with is if you believe that something is beneficial, then it probably will be. That's called the placebo effect. So if you believe in power poses and you think that they serve you, then they will. And a power pose is a pose in which you're physically taking up space. You're making yourself large. So you're showing that you're kind of king of the jungle, top of the food chain, that you're not timid and twisted up and pretzeled. You're large and in charge. So whatever you can do to be open and not guarded, you are unafraid because you're a lion, right? Nobody can destabilize you. That would be a power pose. So like throwing your feet up, putting your arms back, being the wonder woman. Yeah, that's it. That's a power pose, man. And Cuddy contends that when we arrange our body in that physical way, it triggers the release of uh, testosterone, which is a power chemical and makes us feel dominant and it lessens the flow of cortisol, which is a stress hormone. Perhaps that's untrue though. I'm not sure, something to look into perhaps. What we do know for sure is true is that this pose, which you can call fiero, is universally present across cultures and that people throw up their arms in triumph when they've achieved something awesome. So, Athletes everywhere do this, always have. And this pose in particular can be really useful for helping you to feel like a champion. So not only is it something that you can do after you've achieved, it's something that you can do 
in anticipation of achievement and you'll feel all of that good juju. Mm. I also recommend before a talk, if you're feeling anxious, to take some really deep breaths. Breath is life. Breath helps us to manage and quell some of our nervous energy. It helps us to center. And again, the positive self-talk, you might even want to go so far as to do something sort of CBT-esque. That stands for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. So you might want to replace an irrational thought with a rational thought. The irrational thought being, I'm going to fail and everyone will laugh at me. What are the odds of that? The rational thought is, it's going to be fine. You might even want to tell yourself something a little bit more cheerleady than it will be fine. You might want to tell yourself that it will be amazing, depending on what works for you. Yeah. Tony Robbins does the breathing exercise and go like this. Awesome. And then he also has like a little mini trampoline before he goes to his doctor, like goes on this trampoline and right, jumps right. on And he gets all that energy and wrapped up? And goes on there with fire. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. Well, let's take a moment, and I'd like for you all to, uh, to do some physical things that you think will help you to manage your anxiety or to up your energy right before a talk. So is that taking some deep breaths? Is that doing the Tony Robbins? What will that look like for you? Is it spending some time looking inside, telling yourself some rational things? I don't know, but I'm going to invite you to do it, to do it now. I'm going to come back at you in about a minute. All right? Do what it takes to get ready for a talk. Oh. <laughs> I probably would like to do something like that. So like, yeah, like getting a little bit of so let's bring it back in. Show me you're ready when you got your beautiful face smiling up at me. Love it. Thank you, Chris. No problem. This is really what. Okay. So now let's talk about being anxious within the context of your speech. You're talking and all of a sudden your nerves are mounting. Maybe you find yourself shaking, um, maybe you're sweating, uh, you're starting to feel the nerves. In that case, I invite you to breathe. Once again, breath is life, baby. Why breathing is particularly useful during the talk, again, it helps us manage our nerves but it also provides us with an opportunity to pause. Pausing is useful for you, the audience, and it's useful for me, the speaker. It's useful for you, the audience. Why? Why do you appreciate it when a speaker pauses? Yeah, just, wait, remind me of your name? Uh, Jared? Jared. Yeah, it's kind of, um, I don't know, if they're just droning on and on, you don't really know like where the focus is or you know, if you can tune out or not. Right, right. Like it just sort of becomes like a wall of sound, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that the pause is sort of like punctuation. Yeah, Solomon? Also, um, like remember learning, like it takes seven seconds for like your audience to process mm -hmm. what you're actually saying. Mm -hmm. um, so giving them a little bit of time to, to process on, what, on the, the information you just shared. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. The information that you're sharing is novel, right? So it might seem really easy to wrap your head around you, might think it is, but you have spent time with it. You know all about this. That's why you're speaking, and you have prepped it. And they are hearing it for the first time. Plus, they're hearing it, right? Because text on screen is basically a no-no, they're not able to read it. So they're only getting it through one venue. And that might not be their best venue for learning. It's not being reinforced, at least, by text. So you have to really make sure that they're getting a chance to process it auditorially. Susan? Um, I was going to say also, if it's like in this type of setting where we're taking notes, it gives us time to like 
They'd be like, okay, what did she say? Like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if there's a pause, I'm like, okay, all right, this is what she just said. Mm -hmm. So like your process is processing it and writing it down for like later as well. Yeah, that's right. It's an excellent point. Definitely. The pause, um, then I just paired it with a question. We're going to get there later. But you notice how all of your ideas like super enriched the talk. And now this talk got better, and maybe you'll credit me with it. Um, <laughs> but it's because of the gems that your friends shared. So it behooves you to pause and to collaborate. We'll get to the collaboration later. So all of those reasons that it's useful for the audience to pause. It's useful for me to pause, because then I can gather my thoughts. Uh, also, then I can take another breath. Breath is life. Then I won't run out of breath. Breathing is my recommendation to replace a verbal filler, like the word like or um, or you know is one that people have been building on a lot. Often people use the verbal filler to buy themselves time. You can buy yourself time more effectively by pausing. It's cleaner, it seems more professional. Another reason why people use verbal fillers is just simply because it's a habit in which case you need to raise your consciousness to that habit so you know when it's happening and then you can consciously try to replace it with pause. So in addition to breathing, in order to maintain your calm and to fight back the anxiety during the talk, I also recommend that you remind yourself that you're speaking from a spirit of service, that you're there to help people that you have something that will be useful to them. And I feel like when we're in the space of service, we're thinking about generosity, teaching, and making the world a better place, it helps us to be a little bit less freaked out because it isn't about performance, it's about sharing. For me, that's useful. Whatever might help you to take this out of um, a scary world in which people are mean, and to return it to something uh, comfortable and more accessible is what you should go with. And I'd also like to remind you that the audience appreciates you. And they're probably glad that it isn't them up there. <laughs> and they might not even be paying attention to you. Not because you're uninteresting, but because our lives are so busy and uh, complicated that they might be somewhere else. So let's not overindulge in this fantasy of people judging you negatively. They're probably judging you positively, if they're judging at all. And for the few bad apples who have mean thoughts, what a shame. It must be tough to be them. I wonder what happened to them in their early life. Let's not worry about them. Yeah. yeah, but isn't there's ways of the, there's ways that the speaker can uh, use like tactics to command the audience with, um, attention. Mm -hmm. There there are some tactics like in terms of uh, a hook, like sharing a story or a startling statistic or something that you're not familiar with. Is that what you mean? Or you know. Effective nonverbal communication. It seems like you have an idea. I'd love to hear it. Oh no, I'm not the expert. I'm just I'm here to learn. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm just asking. Uh, well, yes. So when we talk about commanding, what the I, I mean, what I've seen when there's distractions in the audience, like comedians, they'll address it, acknowledge it, hmm. and, and and all light will go to the distraction, right. and then and then get the audience to get back or they'll pause, or eye contact. Just different small. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so, in the collaborating with our audience section, which let's talk about um, because it's germane, some of the ways in which you can establish rapport with the audience is to be aware of them, right? To scan the audience, to constantly be checking in, to maintain a dialogue. So, folks communicate with us non verbally in terms of the way that they're sitting, the way that they're maintaining <laughs> eye contact, whether they're just listening to you or talking to a partner, which 
uh, remind me of your name? Charlie. Charlie mentioned. So in his example of comedy show, especially with a heckler, sometimes the comedian might choose to look at that person, and sometimes what that comedian does is basically shame them. I don't necessarily cre recommend creating an adversarial relationship with the people in your audience and shaming them into silence, uh, but you can uh, decide to directly address people who are in the audience, invite them to volunteer or to ask a question. You can make an observation like, Clearly, Chris here is loving it, or something like that. You know what I mean? Um, in order to show that you're engaged and to impress upon the audience the fact that you can call on them at any time, or you can acknowledge them at any time, so they're not anonymous and they're not invisible. So that can inspire them to attend to what you're saying a little bit more. And it can help them also to feel like we're building something together. Okay, so now we've talked about maintaining um, our calm in general when we think about public speaking, before speech, during a speech. And here's my last bit of advice. Again, coming back to the audience, you can establish an ally in the room. So someone who is safe and even sort of inspiring to return to, to land on. Someone who's really actively engaged is someone who I like to turn to a lot. So actually all of you are giving me great face right now. Um, so I feel like the room is full of allies. Thank you. Um, Chris in particular, do you see how his whole body is turned towards me? I can really tell that he's listening and my ego loves it. Okay? <laughs> Whenever I want to feel like I'm succeeding, I take a look at him and I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so having this ally in the audience is key to my success. It makes me feel like I'm rocking it out. <laughs> so when I want to gather strength or I want a little bit of affirmation, I can turn to this guy. Sometimes when you're giving a talk, you're not able to see the audience because of the way in which the lighting is functioning. And in that case, you can picture someone uh, who you really dearly love is there in the back of the room smiling and encouraging you. So use an ally to be a source of strength and to keep you kicking ass. Okay, let's talk about authenticity. So by authenticity, I mean you. I mean you being your real you, not being a robot. This is the no robot self. People love real, authentic, three-dimensional humans who are imperfect and fascinating. I get a true sense of the real person in the room when a speaker talks to me off the top of his or her head, not that they haven't prepared, but that they haven't memorized. So that style of speech is called extemporaneous. It means extemporaneous. So. It is not memorized, it's not a recitation, and it's not completely impromptu, where like you give me the word like sailboat, and all of a sudden I'm like giving a talk about sailboats. <laughs> okay, so that's impromptu, where you're totally caught unawares. That's straight up improvisation. An extemporaneous talk is when you come in with a plan, but not with the particular language and phrasing. So I knew that I wanted to talk about honoring authenticity, for example, but I didn't memorize every single sentence that I've just shared with you. I just had some general ideas of what I was going to share. Extemporaneous speech shows that you're not a robot. It's interesting. When we're speaking in our conversational voices, then we naturally have emphasis in our voice. So sometimes when you read, you tend to be really flat. It's that wall of sound that Jarrett was mentioning. When we're speaking as real human beings, then there tends to be leverage of a few mechanisms for our voice. We tend to leverage volume. We get louder and softer. We leverage rate, so we speed up and we slow down. We leverage pitch, so sometimes we use a bit of a higher pitch and our voice goes up, and sometimes our voice goes down. And that variation is interesting. And finally, we leverage tone. 
So there's emotional color, if you will, to our voice. We might sound a little bit more excited at times. We might sound surprised. We might sound a little bit sadder or more serious. All of those emotions coloring our speech, again, make it interesting. That naturally happens when we talk as real humans. And you can also seek to pump up your nonverbal communication when you use your voice. I'd also like to talk to you about the importance of story. I already said, we're storytelling creatures, right? So if you want to engage the audience, not only show up like a person who's speaking extemporaneously, but show us a little bit about who you are by telling us a story. Then I get to hear a bit about your lived experience. I get to hear your vernacular, you know, the words that you use organically that make you you. That's a really effective way to be your authentic self, to be an interesting individual. Yes. Yeah. Um, I want to ask because a lot of times, like the presentations that the students, um, you know, in the School of Education are doing, they're presenting other information. Would it still be beneficial for them to maybe share a story that they read about related to mm -hmm. the, you know, topic at hand, even though it's not their personal narrative? Yes, yes. If there's a story in your research, um, then feel free to share it, absolutely. You can also share a story about why you think that this is so interesting or come up with a scenario in which this might be applied. The more stories you can tell, the better, I think. So, so this cartoon sort of illustrates the idea that you can own your expertise, right? The people can't necessarily tell what you know and what you don't know, um, that if you show up confidently and you own your expertise, then we're going to assume that you are an expert. So obviously, you should be ethical, you should do your homework, I'm not telling you to misrepresent, but I am saying that if you show up with confidence, We'll take your word for it, and we'll go on the ride. And since you're all in this program, there are things that you know that are worth sharing with others, and that you have a right to command the room. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about humor. We're coming up to the end of our of our talk, so. I think the lowest hanging fruit when it comes to humor is self-deprecating humor. That's sort of the easiest. So if you want to build in a little bit of comedy, then that can be one way to do it, to sort of good-naturedly poke fun at yourself. You might also think about using some sarcasm. That's also a safe way to use some humor. Um, you can show a meme, so you can benefit from uh, the comedy stylings of others. Um, you can also say the unexpected, that's the definition of humor. So when you think that somebody's going along a certain path and then they pull the rug out from under you and say the thing that you never thought they were going to say, that's usually when we laugh. So that's something that you can play with. Finally, I encourage people to use specificity. Sometimes that makes people laugh. So um, rather than saying that you're going to the mall with your friends, I can really paint a picture for you. Um, when I say that I was going to Old Orchard Mall in Skokie, Illinois with my best friend, Sandra Greenblatt and Andrea Yama. And, and I, I mean, I saw some smiles. It's not like, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard. You know, like I'm, I'm not gonna book um, a Comedy Central pilot off of that material. However, there's something that's kind of endearing and a little bit funny when you hear about people's like cultural, real worlds. So you can think about getting more specific. Those are all sorts of mechanisms for adding a little bit of humor to your talk. The most important thing is that you're authentic, and so if cracking jokes and being super funny doesn't feel like it's in your wheelhouse, you don't have to do any of this. A little bit of this might be effective. Play around with it. 
So now let's talk about improvising. I already did it to a certain extent when Charlie popped in with some ideas, when some of you guys asked questions. Expect the unexpected, work with what you've got. In this picture, the guy is looking at the, at the uh, dog wearer um, with some stupefaction. But as I already sort of mentioned, nobody else has your script, um, so they don't know if you're going off book or if you're sticking to your plan. Um, finally, we talked about collaborating with the audience. So scan the audience, see what's going on with them, acknowledge, talk to them. I like to invite interactivity and pair work, which we already did a bit of today. I also like to share power by asking people to bring their questions. So again, this is uh, a shared conversational opportunity as opposed to a soliloquy. And with that, are there any questions? Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> uh, throughout your presentation, you know, you mentioned words or text on the present or on the PowerPoint is a no-no. Uh, but a lot of times, students are sharing, you know statistical information, research, mm -hmm. um, to what extent would you, in academic presentation settings, would you incorporate text into your slides? That is such a good question. Thank you. Um, that's also a best practice for asking questions. I always thank the person. And if you want to buy yourself some time, say, what a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I actually do know the answer, though. Um, so I think that less is more, and there are certain sort of rules of thumb that you might find if you were to do a quick Googling about sixes. So you don't want more than six words on a line. You don't want more than six lines on a page. And then there are certain minimums when it comes to font size. I think you don't want anything maybe smaller than 30. So the point is that everything should be really legible and it shouldn't be too much to read. When should you include text? when the specific information is the thing that you want them to walk away with those numbers or with um, a quotation from uh, a particular scholar or if there's a qualitative data from a research participant. When that information is key, then include it and make it really clear, front and center, and not too much on the slide. So really focus their attention, make it very easy to observe. Thank you. Thank you. Right, well, I think the next class is coming in, so I want to okay. thank you, Dr. Phelps. Thank, so you. thank you. It's a pleasure to speak with all of you. Please come up and talk to me, and if you want more information, or even to work with me privately, I offer free consultations of 30 minutes over the phone. Feel free to get in touch. I'm at laurelfelt.org. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please take goodie bags. And if you haven't signed in, you can sign in. Thank you. 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 Thank you.